uh, today's topic is actually a continuation of last week's uh, topic, which is the uh, six perfections. In the uh, Mahayana tradition is often also called uh, the Bodhisattva Yana, in that um, one understands that uh, we suffer, but so does, so do all sentient beings suffer. And the Bodhisattva has uh, taken a vow as a spiritual warrior to attain Buddhahood for the benefit of all suffering beings. And there is a method to attain Buddhahood, and it is known as the Six Paramitas. This is the uh, uh, six perfections of how one traverses. It's like a boat crossing uh, the river to the other side. And uh, that is from samsara, suffering, to Buddhahood, complete enlightenment. And the Buddha was uh, very skillful in teaching 84,000 different uh, methods for attaining Buddhahood. Uh, but this six perfections, um, specifically being the perfection of generosity, of uh, ethical discipline, of patience, of enthusiastic effort, of uh, concentration, also called meditation, and um, wisdom, uh, prajna paramita. So these first five are really the means to attain the, uh, the, the sixth, which is uh, wisdom, the understanding of the true nature of our mind, our Buddha nature. So it's uh, about cultivating merit. It's about uh, uh, skillful uh, activity in the world of body, speech, and mind and uh, ultimately leading to omniscience, Buddhahood. It's hard to think about omniscience, um, but that is uh, what Prajnaparamita uh, means is the uh, essence of our Buddha mind, and uh, that is complete enlightenment. So, uh, and there are a couple of things. Uh, the uh, first five are really the cultivation of bodhicitta, the cultivation of uh, loving kindness and compassion. And the sixth is uh, the understanding of uh, emptiness, which is, um, leads to the wisdom, prajnaparamita. So those uh, first uh, loving kindness and compassion is uh, known as uh, bodhicitta, or the mind of enlightenment. So these are the two wings of the bird that uh, take us to the goal of enlightenment, loving kindness and compassion, bodhicitta, and prajna, this uh, wisdom. Uh, we need both of those. Just loving kindness and compassion is uh, wonderful, and we're going to be talking about uh, that uh, as we cultivate uh, generosity, uh, ethical or uh, discipline, morality, ethics, those are all part of the second one. Patience, um, effort, joyful effort, and um, meditation. Those are the active uh, qualities that lead to uh, bodhicitta. And uh, as we perfect each of those, that uh, results in wisdom. Does that make sense? Okay, so bodhicitta is uh, the mind of enlightenment of the Buddhas and bodhisattvas uh, cultivating um, loving kindness and compassion. And but have you heard the term bodhisattva before? Is this new, bodhisattva? So bodhisattvas um, are really the spiritual warriors uh, who have decided to work for the benefit of all beings and uh, continually, uh, diligently, um, through their love and compassion, see all beings uh, as their mothers and wish them um, two things. Uh, love, uh, and love means uh, wanting all beings to be happy, and compassion, not wanting them to suffer. So two things, loving kindness and compassion. Loving kindness, uh, we wish all beings to be happy and have the causes of happiness, and um, May they not suffer or have the causes of suffering. So what are the causes of happiness? The causes of happiness is virtue, right action, skillful, 
action in body, speech, and mind. And not to suffer or have the causes of suffering. What are the causes of suffering? Unwholesome you might imagine just the opposite. Unskillful actions, unwholesome uh, behavior, uh, things that take us away from our own Buddha nature. And uh, we'll talk a, a little bit as we go about the, uh, the kind of vows that uh, one takes as one enters the uh, spiritual path as a Buddhist and uh, to cultivate virtue and to avoid doing harm and uh, unvirtuous activity because the consequences of those things will follow you like your shadow. Unvirtuous action leads to suffering. Virtuous action leads to uh, happiness and well-being now and in the future. So uh, the Buddha is very clear on this and how we uh, practice uh, these things. Uh, the uh, Buddha initially taught Four Noble Truths, you know, the, uh, the, the truth of suffering, because we have been unskillful, you know, um, in previous lives. We uh, understand Buddhism uh, says there's no first cause, no beginning, since beginningless time. We have continued to um, uh, circle in samsara from birth to birth. And uh, we've had the good fortune now and merit to be born in a situation where we can understand, have all of the, uh, of the qualities and necessities to practice and to realize our Buddha nature. There's a Buddha who, of our time, uh, Shakyamuni Buddha, who lived 2,500 years ago and uh, taught. And we have the good fortune of being in his um, uh, um, a series of teachings. And it's been passed down for 2,500 years from uh, a teacher to student in uh, several unbroken lineages, and we'll talk a little bit more about lineage along the way too. But these, um, that is our great good fortune, and it's not an accident that you're here, and as I always say, in this seat and listening to Dharma, there has been some seeds, some karmic uh, connection. There are causes and conditions that have led uh, to your uh, thinking that maybe I should get up in the morning and do all those things and drive to this place and listen to Dharma. Of all the possibilities, that you could be doing, you chose this one, and that didn't happen by accident. There were a number of things that had to happen for you to be in that seat or that chair. So that is the, um, the goal of the Bodhisattva, is to attain Buddhahood for the benefit of all beings, not just for their own uh, benefit. And that's the difference between the Hinayana, or Arhat, who wishes to escape um, the samsara and uh, to attain nirvana, and the uh, Mahayana tradition of the bodhisattvas who say, yes, uh, I do wish to uh, get out of samsara, but I wish to benefit all suffering beings as well and attain Buddhahood uh, for that benefit, for their benefit as well. So that is the um, bodhisattva attitude. And when we look at these six perfections, it is with this bodhisattva attitude that we cultivate them. Yeah? Question? Okay. I think we all know who the Buddha is, the historical Buddha of our time, the Shakyamuni Buddha, who lived, uh, as I say, about 2,500 years ago and uh, taught uh, from his uh, realization, from his uh, enlightened perspective. When he first became enlightened and began teaching, his, uh, the, the people he was teaching said, who are you? And he said, I am awake. So we want to awake from the delusion, illusion of... Um, our ignorance and wake up to who we truly are. And the Buddha's uh, kind of revolutionary thing is that we all possess this Buddha nature. We are all Buddhas, but we've uh, obscured it uh, because of our wrong thinking, uh, because of our wrong views. And uh, the good news is that that can be uh, remedied and we can directly experience uh, our Buddha nature. And in fact, that's our destiny that all of us will do sooner or later. Can this word Buddha be translated in English in some way? Does it mean like wisdom or knowledge? Or? Um, well, uh, well, we can say Sanjay uh, is the word Buddha in uh, Tibetan. And Sanjay means one who has uh, completely eliminated wrongdoing and ignorance and has cultivated all virtue and uh, skillful means. Um, Buddha basically means awakened one. But you understand uh, how one does that by disengaging and uh, purifying 
uh, negativity and by cultivating and uh, um, a skillful action, virtue. And that's really what we're talking about here with the six perfections, is how we cultivate virtue, how we avoid doing harm to ourselves and others, which leads to suffering, as we were saying. So all of these uh, causes um, and uh, there's interdependence, you know, as we were saying, this, uh, the fact that you're here, there are a number of things that had to come together for uh, this to happen. And it's true with your birth, it's true with everything, uh, that uh, there's a, a certain um, interdependent uh, relationship. Whether it's the uh, clothes you're wearing, the uh, clouds that uh, made the rain, that made the cotton, that made the thread that then was dyed and someone transported it. Some Anyway, it took a lot for this <coughs> zen, as it's called, uh, to get on my shoulders. And it's true with everything, interdependence. So all things are in change and flux. So this is a part of the aspect that we, we see and contemplate the interdependence of all things. Causation. So there's a cause to Buddhahood. And uh, that cause is the uh, cultivation and completion of the six perfections that we're gonna, we talked about. And by avoiding and uh, purifying the uh, uh, disturbing emotions, anger, greed, jealousy, all those things that uh, create uh, negative emotions and uh, we uh, transmute those into the positive aspects that we'll be talking about. Six perfections. All right, so we talked about Bodhisattva, the Mahayana practitioner um, resolves to become a Buddha, not for his own benefit or her own benefit, but uh, for the benefit of all beings, and the understanding is the only way we can be of benefit to others is to perfect our own mind. That way we know what's needed, and uh, you know, it's, uh, that's the way we can be most effective to release living beings from their suffering in cyclic existence, is by becoming a Buddha and uh, traversing the path that the bodhisattvas have taken and uh, guided by compassion. So those first five, um, uh, uh, paramitas are about cultivating uh, compassion and then leading to, as I say, the wisdom. <coughs> and we mentioned Buddha, we mentioned Buddha nature, you know, it's, this is um, who you are, you know, this is um, your essence. And as we were saying, we've been wandering in cyclic existence since beginningless time, and uh, from birth, death, rebirth. It's important to understand karma and uh, reincarnation in terms of the Buddhist uh, cosmology, that uh, we've been prisoners, really, in uh, samsaric existence. And um, there's a point that we say, I understand that, and I will work diligently to uh, break those chains of uh, disturbing emotions and ignorance that keep this um, samsaric existence uh, going and uh, wish true freedom for myself and for others. So that is about dispelling ignorance and having the right view, and that's what the Buddha taught, you know, how we uh, can end suffering. And as I mentioned uh, briefly, the, the Buddha, when he uh, came uh, to in this incarnation 2,500 years ago, said he was here for one thing and one thing only, and that was to end suffering. And uh, how, do, how do we become released from this endless Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. It's not what happens to you. It's the way you think about it. It's the perspective that you have about it. And uh, it changes everything. I mean, how you think affects your neurotransmitters. It affects your hormones. It affects every aspect of your body, mind, and spirit. And um, so having the right view. There's a reason. Yes, the Dalai Lama's uh, 
uh, laugh is infectious and he laughs a lot. Uh, and anyone who has any level of realization understands the nature of reality. It's not about happiness um, necessarily. That's fleeting, it's impermanent. If you're always grasping onto happiness, uh, you know, the degree of your happiness uh, or your suffering is the degree of your clinging. If you're clinging to something, if you're attached to something, inevitably it's going to cause suffering. If you understand impermanence, if you understand the, uh, the constant change and flux, uh, you're not going to be attached to uh, the little uh, circumstances. And uh, ultimately that does lead to happiness. It has the right view. And that is the first of the uh, uh, eightfold path, is having the right view of the nature of reality. So I, was, I began uh, talking briefly about uh, the, the noble, um, or the four noble truths. The first one being that um, there is suffering. And uh, I often mention that the Buddha often compared himself you know, to a, a physician. And often this suffering is compared to a, a disease. We have this disease. We have this uh, suffering. We have this clinging, this attachment to a self, to things. And uh, as we were saying, the degree of our suffering is the degree of our attachment. So we have this uh, dis-ease. We have this suffering. Things are not always the way we want them. Uh, suffering may seem too intense, but we can say that dissatisfaction, dukkha, um, is often the, uh, the Sanskrit word. So uh, suffering is um, not necessarily always physical pain. You know, it's mental, emotional pain as well. Yes? So the second uh, of these is the origin, or you know, the, is like the diagnosis. You know, the cause of suffering is ignorance. So there's a cause of suffering. It's our wrong understanding. Um, not understanding causation and interdependence, uh, that kind of thing. And uh, thirdly, the truth that um, there is a cessation we c uh, to, to suffering. We can end suffering. So that is uh, like the prognosis. OK, we have this disease. Um, we have this diagnosis. We have a certain uh, prognosis here that uh, we can uh, cure this suffering. So I mean, it, it, it's subjective then. I mean, this is what it, in other words, there's no such thing as suffering. I mean, suffering is just the way you respond to the environment. A Buddha does not suffer uh, because he has the right understanding about the nature of reality. It's very subjective, but you have to have the right view to understand what's real and what's not real. So we have a reality, uh, you know, relative reality. We're on this place. Yes, we can get hurt. We do, can have physical pain, but uh, and there's ultimate reality, the nature, the true nature of uh, existence. So there's two truths, you know, the relative reality and ultimate reality, which we'll we'll talk about a little bit. Uh, in a moment, but it's very subjective, and uh, two people can experience the same thing, and one suffers tremendously and the other one doesn't. Yeah. So the fourth of the uh, Four Noble Truths is that, uh, you know, it's, and it's compared to the cure, and that is basically uh, walking the Eightfold Path, you know, that the, that the Buddha taught, the Eightfold Path being, first of all, uh, having a right view, as we mentioned. You have to have the, you know, have to know how to get to here, here to there, and um, the Buddha gave us a, a clear map on how to do that. The uh, second is right intention. You know, we have to embody speech and mind. We have to uh, uh, have the right intent, which is understanding, uh, like we're saying, the uh, bodhisattva uh, level. The um, and within that comes several aspects, having right speech, not to lie, not to uh, engage in gossip or backbiting or speech, cultivating pure speech, cultivating uh, right action. So we're talking about speech uh, and body right action, uh, certainly not killing, not harming, um, being uh, careful in our body, in our speech, right livelihood, uh, you know, doing things that are uh, uh, beneficial to beings, not uh, harming them, killing them, making munitions or bombs or doing things that are made for one thing only and that's uh, to kill or to create a suffering. So right livelihood we have to uh, uh, consider and right uh, effort. It does require uh, some effort uh, no matter what you're doing. If um, I often make the uh, 
the example, if you want to be a concert pianist or world-class athlete or uh, an artist, or it takes effort. You know, you do have to apply yourself towards uh, the goal. And uh, a right mindfulness in the way of meditation, uh, we, you know, the uh, being mindful, there's a lot of uh, things in the literature. Uh, pretty much every discipline talks about mindfulness now. And right meditation, you know. So being skilled in taming your mind. All the Buddhist teaching can be um, pretty much summarized in cultivating virtue, avoid doing harm, and taming your mind. So all of the teachings are pretty much about that. That's Buddhism, the middle way. So it's true. I mean, uh, some uh, the vegetarians or Buddhists uh, can be very uh, high and mighty about uh, uh, not killing. But in fact, more people can eat from a cow than they can from a broccoli. Uh, and when they're uh, doing the, the harvesting of these things, uh, big combines uh, going through uh, and uh, harvesting uh, certain crops, rabbits and birds and animals, and things are going to die for you to have food. It's inevitable. But uh, our awareness, our cultivation of um, this uh, mindfulness is to do the best we can to avoid that. So, you know, you don't intentionally kill. That's great, but you know, every time you till the soil or every time you do something, those little worms or little critters or something gets displaced or um, it just, you know, you go and drive your car, those little bugs are going to smush against your windshield. Uh, but that's not our intention. And uh, to say, oh, may, may those beings, uh, you know, be reborn in a pure realm. You know, you, you just want to continue to cultivate the right attitude about it. And you do the best you can, as consciously as you can, understanding that the goal is uh, may all beings be happy and may they avoid, you know, harm. Yeah. yeah for me, the heart of this is the meditation because it's very hard to abstain from engaging a mind that's not spacious, a mind that's begun to uh, soften its uh, uh, identification with the arising of all these thoughts and emotions. It's hard to feel a tender heart toward beings that are in another realm, insects, etc., until the heart is open more. So without that practice, it's very difficult to cultivate skillful means of behavior we're dealing with what's rising in one's consciousness so to me the heart of this is actual practice and engaging in it and then utilizing it in one's actions that awareness because yeah that's why the as long part. as we're identified with what arises through our consciousness <coughs> we're victimized again and again and again so all of this, as we mentioned, has to do with certain causes and conditions. And we all come with a particular kind of uh, history since beginningless time. And people have cultivated different uh, qualities. That's why the Buddha taught in so many different ways. So uh, the practice that you do may be different from the person who, who does this practice. But practice in terms of turning your mind towards the Dharma and cultivating these uh, virtues that we're talking about inevitably is the way that uh, leads to ultimately wisdom and uh, having the right understanding the right view is um, the first aspect of this uh, noble eightfold path so it can take a lot of different forms depending upon the nature of each individual mind so the, the practice on a regular basis having that in your mind whether it's a sitting practice or whether you're uh, walking standing sitting uh, lying down, um, it is a matter of cultivating awareness, as we say, 24-7. And we w become, uh, we're not used to doing this, so it begins, you know, with our sitting practice, then we expand that out and uh, broaden it to include more and more, uh, even, uh, you, know, uh, you know, so we get to see the thoughts that we think. And often the thoughts that we think are very repetitive. And these are what we call habitual patterns. You know, something happens, we immediately have a knee-jerk response with anger or jealousy or these kinds of things. And uh, the meditation allows us to create a little space so we don't have to engage in that knee-jerk response.
that is a habitual pattern, and we've been doing it for a long, long time, but we have the opportunity to change. That's the good news. This is not written in stone. Karma does not mean it's fixed. The good news is that everything's impermanent, including these habitual patterns, and they can be changed. But first of all, we have to become aware of them, and then we can apply the appropriate uh, remedy uh, to uh, change it. All right? So we, we, and this is what really the, uh, the six perfections are about, is transforming uh, these perfections into habits. So we, we know we have habitual negative uh, tendencies. We want to have uh, habitual positive tendencies. And we can, uh, do, <clears throat> we can do that uh, through these, um, these antidotes um, you know, to our obscured thoughts. But first, we have to know we have obscured thoughts. And we see them, we say, oh, that's interesting. Um, with a, we don't have to believe everything our mind says. Oh, that's interesting. Mind is going to say this, that, the next thing, make judgments, as we were saying all the time. But um, we just view it with a, like clouds in the sky, neither good nor bad. There's no judgment about it. Uh, it's a thought. As we say, just like the sun doesn't say to the cloud, bad cloud. Um, it just has its time of arising, has its moment dissolves back into emptiness. Thoughts are the same way. They come from nowhere. They're nothing, but our thoughts can create such problems for us if we let them. We don't recognize them as being so ephemeral and so empty of any essential uh, aspect. Um, they're just thoughts, having their moment and gone. Uh, for many of us that may not have been into uh, spiritual path as such, uh, so things to me that perhaps you could talk a little bit about are evaluating the foundation for cultivating practice, these four fundamental truths that one would, would consider to see whether they're valid, uh, human, precious human body, et cetera. Perhaps you could talk about that a little bit because I think without that foundation, it's very hard to secure and feed a spiritual practice effectively because one has to have that foundation to do so. Well, some people need more prodding than others, it's true, and uh, the four thoughts that turn the mind to dharma, I will mention briefly, I, I do uh, want to try to finish these last three uh, paramitas. So what uh, is being referred to are, is what's called the uh, four thoughts that turn the mind to dharma, and um, when we're uh, contemplating these things, the first of which is this precious human birth. You know, this is hard to find. We, we take it for granted that we're born human, and um, this is you know, pretty uh, routine. It is not. It's very difficult to have this, uh, this precious human incarnation. Um, you've been born in all kinds of different realms. There are six realms in the Buddhist tradition, which I spoke last time of. I'm not going to go into it in detail now. But to be born human is considered very auspicious. We have all the causes and conditions necessary to realize our Buddha nature. We are born at a time when the Buddha's uh, teaching is available, and we have, again, all of the uh, uh, resources. Uh, we can contemplate it. We have actually leisure time to practice. You may disagree with that, but we do. Um, maybe a little less time from Facebook, maybe a little less time uh, in doing some other nonsense. So uh, the first one is this precious human birth. The second one is uh, impermanence. This life is impermanent. We don't know how long we have. Um, I mean, I used to look at the uh, obituaries regularly to see that there are infants, there are uh, young people, there are teenagers, there are middle age, there are, none of us know how long we have. So with that understanding, <clears throat> it's like, oh, well, I'll do that later. When it comes to Dharma, good luck with that. As I usually say, we don't know what's gonna come first, death or dinner. And it's like that. I've had two heart attacks. Either one of those could have taken me out literally in a heartbeat. I uh, had the good fortune of uh, being able to survive it, but some people don't. Uh, so impermanence. Um, uh, the, um, the third is um, karma. You know, so what you're thinking right now, uh, what you're doing, um, is the catalyst for what comes next. Um, so cultivating virtue, if it's like the grooves of the record. If we're used to doing something over and over again, the likelihood of us doing that again is enhanced. The more we do it, the more we're likely to do it. That's just how it works. 
So once we disengage <clears throat> from the negative behavior and begin to cultivate the virtuous activities, we're saying we're trying to uh, substitute virtuous habitual patterns from the negative habitual patterns, that changes our karmic result, causes and conditions. Karmas, causes and conditions, causes, uh, you know, effect, a cause and effect. Um, and it's not written in stone. Again, uh, we can change uh, negative behaviors that we may have engaged in in the past, but it requires mindfulness. It requires attention and it requires discipline and uh, practice. Precious human birth, the um, impermanence, the karma, and fourthly, the unsatisfactoriness of uh, samsara or living an ignorant life. Ignorance is not bliss. Ignorance leads to more karmic suffering. So with that understanding, <clears throat> we turn our mind to the Dharma and uh, work diligently to realizing our true Buddha nature. So as um, it was suggested, we uh, contemplate those uh, four thoughts. And uh, it serves as a catalyst to propel our practice. OK. So, um, any, fun, any questions or comments? All right. So the uh, first uh, couple of, um, of these uh, uh, paramitas that take us uh, across the river of suffering from samsara to uh, Buddhahood. The first is generosity. I'm just going to briefly review the ones that we did. Some of you weren't here. The first is generosity. That is the first perfection. Uh, and uh, there are three different aspects uh, to generosity or giving. It's the giving of material things. You know, we, often when we think of giving, it's like, okay, we take something out of our pocket and give it to the poor beggar or whatever it is like that. And so that is the, the most superficial aspect of giving, uh, the physical kinds of things to people who are in need. So that is... Um, and we do it, you know, without expectation. This is, you know, the highest giving is not, oh, I'm going to give it to you, so you give me something back, or that you think well of me, or that, that you know, quid pro I do this for you, you do this for me. It's done out of the spirit of uh, uh, ultimate generosity, out of loving kindness and compassion to be of benefit uh, to another. So uh, the giving is, uh, that generosity is uh, without any expectation of return, right? The uh, second is the giving of uh, protection, you know, protection from fear. Um, and sometimes that's just uh, talking to somebody who may have got a bad diagnosis about something, being uh, attentive or with a person to kind of comfort them. Uh, that is uh, also um, sometimes more difficult uh, for people than uh, giving uh, physical money or things. Uh, our time is considered valuable. Our emotions to be involved with someone out of compassion, loving kindness, to spend time with them and comfort them, to give them this uh, protection from fear. And it's all of its vast applications. And the, um, the third uh, and considered the highest aspect is uh, the, uh, the giving of dharma for those who are receptive to it. You know, these are... Um, giving instruction on how to live a, a happy, healthy, dharmic life that ultimately will be of greater importance than anything on this uh, worldly physical plane now and in the future. So to help turn the mind towards the dharma, to um, help um, move away from wrongdoing and uh, uh, negative habitual patterns that create suffering now and in the future is considered um, the most uh, auspicious and highest form of giving. So that giving of dharma can also be expressed in a lot of different ways. So for example, uh, and I'm not doing this in a self-promoting thing, but giving uh, to a dharma center. So more people can benefit from that. Many people uh, will, uh, if the center uh, thrives, people can benefit from the giving of dharma in that way. So it's always uh, been the case that uh, people have take great pleasure in uh, providing um, uh, support 
to uh, Dharma centers, Dharma teachers, those kinds of things, because it helps promote it. And if you help a center grow, your Dharma, uh, your merit in that is for anyone who comes in there and uh, benefits from it, it's your merit. Sounds, merit is, uh, takes a lot of different forms. So in, the, in that sense, providing uh, comfort, providing uh, Dharma, uh, your uh, generosity in that regard is, um, that's the first paramita, and you do it without any uh, hope for some kind of uh, return, or that quid pro quo idea that if I do this, then I'll get that. Make sense? Generosity. Lots of different forms. Uh, ethical discipline or morality, you know, um, restraint from harmful activity in body, speech, and mind. Um, often uh, there are five uh, vows that are taken, uh, the lay vows that we consider. Uh, that is precepts not to, not to kill, not to steal, not to lie, um, not to engage in sexual misconduct. Um, not to engage in, in using uh, intoxicants, not to cloud the mind, and then you can do all kinds of uh, negative things as a result of a clouded mind. So those five are taken, um, and those are often considered lay vows, not to kill, not to lie, not to steal, um, sexual misconduct, uh, and uh, intoxicants. Questions about those? Okay, so we're, we're helping others, you know, to, uh, through our, our friendship, our support, protection. This is um, the cultivation of uh, morality, you know, and restraint from uh, doing harmful things and maintaining our vows, you know, the, such as those vows that I just mentioned. A monk, a monk has many more vows than that, but, um, you know, the idea is to benefit living beings and uh, to maintain upper um, morality and ethical um, uprightness. That is the foundation for um, you know, a spiritual practice. You were talking about karma. You can't live um, an undisciplined or uh, an immoral life and um, attain Buddhahood. Can't happen. Um, it requires a peaceful, steady, um, trained mind. So, as I was saying, the, um, all of the Buddhist teaching, we can say, is to cultivate uh, a virtue, a, abandon uh, wrongdoing, and tame your mind. Well, you can do something in a way that's nonviolent. You could uh, be in the military and do something that was in the, you know, the medical corps or do something that was uh, nonviolent and helpful in that way. But yes, uh, if uh, a Buddhist would not, you wouldn't want to be going out and shooting people, dropping bombs and doing those kinds of things. That's not ahimsa. You disengage a person and try to do it with, without hatred, you know, without anger. So, uh, I mean, there are many Buddhist martial artists and the idea is to disengage them and you don't want them to hurt you or to hurt anyone else. So uh, to um, stop them from uh, being a threat to themselves or someone else. No, you, uh, that's, that's really the idea of how can you be skillful. Yeah, yeah, that, that's true. And, uh, but the Buddhist, uh, as the Dalai Lama says, nonviolent. As Gandhi said, nonviolent. There's a difference, you know, and in your mind, it's nonviolent. You had a question? No, you're, you're supporting the people who were hurt, you know, as a result, and you're, you're, you're benefiting beings. You can't say, well, I'm, I, I'm not gonna care of, uh, take care of somebody who's in the military and shot because they were, no. All beings have the same Buddha nature and we support all of them equally. Does that answer your question?
Yes, that's a, well, that's right. I mean, you, you see all beings as your mother. There are no, <laughs> all no, no enemies. In fact, your enemies, are, as the Dalai Lama says, are your best teachers. So you cultivate, without them, you couldn't practice the next uh, paramita that we're going to be talking about, which is patience. All right, so uh, discipline and uh, the third one that we talked about last time is patience. Oh, boy. <laughs> I had a lot of it. <laughs> uh, in two minutes, other, other two, I, we're going to have to do something different again. Okay, so patience. There's a lot. This is just wonderful to talk about. You know, this is uh, really how we cultivate our Buddha nature. And uh, this is the vehicle or the means. Uh, we could talk about this for weeks and, uh, you know, variations on this theme. And it looks like we will be uh, <laughs> at this rate. I really thought I'd get farther than this. But. And uh, as we were saying, the third is patience. And as we were saying that the uh, antidote to anger is patience, to cultivate uh, this, uh, this aspect, this third uh, transcendent perfection, patience, you know, is... Um, kind of to bear up against uh, our troubles. As I was saying, the antidote to, uh, to anger and uh, accepting uh, hardships, accepting uh, suffering. Sometimes it's uh, called forbearance, you know, uh, as well. And uh, Patience also in terms of your practice, you know, in terms of your uh, study of dharma. And uh, to continue to refine your, uh, your practice and reflect uh, on the meaning. And not to be impatient with yourself in the practice. That can be a great detriment and uh, an obstacle. You know, be kind, be patient. Um, we were saying uh, to others, but also to yourself. But that persevering, disciplined, but also patient, you know, in that regard. Sometimes the things we face, you know, in our, our personal um, uh, progress on the path can be difficult, you know, things come up. But understand that we have the wherewithal, we have the capacity to deal with these things effectively. And uh, we will deal with them effectively, but sometimes we lose patience with ourselves uh, and um, have this inner debate going on all the time. Am I doing this right? Is this because I'm not making any progress? It's, this is for someone else. And this debate uh, kind of uh, is around this uh, situation about patience, you know. And we get angry with ourselves and we beat ourselves up. So that means not being angry with yourself too, the antidote. When you find yourself being angry with yourself, you ever been there? Patience. It's very painful, you know, that anger. It always results in, uh, in suffering. These disturbing emotions. All right, any question about those, uh, those three? Uh, generosity, um, patience, ethical, moral, Uprightness, discipline. Yes. Uh, might be useful for some of us. Uh, His Eminence uh, Tysatupa has a series on the Paramitas on YouTube. So those of us who would like to get a little bit more can access the teachings from him. He's one of the four regions of this tradition. So. Yes, you can Google. There's actually some wonderful teachers, Taisitu being one of them, that um, has a, a series of lectures on the, um, on the paramitas. But there are, if you go on uh, YouTube and just uh, search six paramitas, but Taisitu, as you say, is uh, one of our uh, senior uh, uh, teachers. He was just recently at KTD, our monastery in upstate New York. And wonderful, he hasn't been here in a long time. It looks like um, things have relaxed a little bit more for him, so he'll be able to travel more, which is wonderful. So we look forward to um, his uh, coming back uh, to the States more often. So um, I will at least mention the fourth. 
which is enthusiastic effort, the fourth of these transcendent perfections, enthusiastic effort, um, is you know, strength, zeal. Uh, it is the uh, diligence uh, to uh, undertake the Dharma and is, in a sense, maybe, you know, these kind of all build one on the other. But it's, it's very important to have this uh, kind of uh, diligence in practicing the Dharma, or it's not going to happen. When we started uh, doing meditation, I was asking, you know, those people who have been, uh, who are, are here, that were new, you know, do you practice regularly? And it was like, eh, mm -hmm. um, diligence. It requires uh, perseverance and uh, diligence in uh, every undertaking. And there is something to be said like, um, the way we do anything is the way we do everything. So if you're not uh, practicing uh, this, you're probably not diligent in a lot of other things as well. So cultivating diligence uh, in, your, in your practice, in this uh, enthusiastic effort, steadfast, energetic, joyful striving, sometimes it's called uh, joyful uh, perseverance as well, because there's this attitude of uh, a joyfulness in doing it. You actually have an impulse uh, to do this, you know, a feeling of joy in the virtue. That is excellent motivation, you know, when it comes to that. When you feel like inclined, uh, you have that drive, the impulse, um, the enthusiastic effort. So that uh, we could say maybe the root of all perfections. You know, you have to uh, do it to get the result. So creating that stabilizing effect, you know, that enthusiastic effort makes it uh, possible to attain the goal. Without it, it's not going to happen. You know, this enthusiastic effort. And uh, there's uh, much more we need to say about that. Uh, one of the big obstacles, uh, our perseverance uh, or our um, progress on the path is laziness. You know, we're just lazy. Um, so with that, if we understand and we have, we have these four thoughts that turn the mind to Dharma and uh, that cultivates a certain enthusiastic effort, um, it is the antidote to laziness. And, you know, because we're so preoccupied with things um, and we're always doing this, that, and the next thing, in uh, most Buddhist teachers would say, we're lazy. We'll do other things. We'll go on the internet. We will do other kinds of uh, uh, distractions uh, to prevent us from doing that. And that is, uh, in a sense, uh, laziness. It can be hesitation. It can be postponement. You know, oh, I'll do it later. Laziness. I know it's tough to hear. Yeah. Well, motivation seems to be a key in, in all of this. And I think for many of us, the idea of being a Buddha is a pretty lofty and perhaps and not a readily attainable kind of aspiration. In, in it terms, needs to be. It in terms of immediacy. Yeah. Um, but the, the utilization of these methods is very useful in our day-to-day -day conventional existence. And to me, that's a very important motivator that it conjoins with the spiritual effort because if we cultivate this awareness and mindfulness, we're better at everything we do. This, we can bring more skill to our everyday lives in whatever we're pursuing. And that, to me, is a huge motivator for those of us that are sort of on the path, but we're maybe Buddha is a little bit out there always. So, uh, we have to think the Buddha is right. It's closer than hands and feet. Yeah. Uh, and I, I would suggest you have that as your uh, go-to fallback default position. <laughs> okay, on that happy note, we will stop there and uh, take a short break, and then we'll continue with our reading. Thank you very much for your diligence and hanging in there. <laughs>